Good afternoon. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. At this time, I would like to call the Tuesday, January 14th, 2020 Planning Board meeting to order. May I ask everyone to stand with us for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any members that have any conflicts of interest with respect to any of the items on the agenda tonight? Okay, hearing none. Madam Secretary, we have a quorum with six people. Are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Uh, we're going to elect officers being it's the first meeting of the year. And so I believe that's the only change. I don't know if we need to actually change anything, but. It is on the agenda. Okay. So we're good. All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the agenda as presented. I'll make the motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, agenda is approved. Are there any changes to the December 10th meeting minutes? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the minutes as presented. So moved. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm opposed. The minutes from the December 10th meeting are approved. Uh, are there any items of old business tonight? We do have some items of old business. We have two. Uh, first up is, sorry, we need to do We'll do, do that. nominations. Okay, first. I'm skipping way ahead, <laughs> sorry. At this time, we'll open the floor for nominations of chairman. Do we have any nominations? I'll nominate Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a second. We have a nomination and a second. Do we have a motion? A motion to approve. Second. Oh, sorry. Shay, you will now be okay. chairman of the uh, planning board for this next year. All right. Thank you. And thank all of you for thinking I'm doing a good job. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll open the floor for uh, nominations for vice chairman. I'd make a motion for Gary Owens. Second. Any other nominations? We'll close the nominations. We have a motion. You need a motion? Is that what you said? Or, okay, I'll, I'll make the motion. I don't know that we do, but we will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gary, you are now um, vice chairman for the next year. Thank you. Thank you. Are we good to move on now? We are good to move on. All right. First item of old business is PB 1927, uh, quality homes of Curry Tuck of Windswept Pines, driveway width and setback tax amendment. Request to amend Chapter 5 of the Unified Development Ordinance to allow driveway widths of up to 40 feet when located on a street with curb and gutter section and where the allowable lot coverage is not exceeded. 
The amendment also proposes to revise Chapter 3 to reduce the driveway setback from side property lines to 5 feet as opposed to the current requirement of 10 feet. And Miss Miss Valva or whoever. Mr. Chairman, Jason and Literal and I will both be uh, tag teaming this one. Um, so this was something that came before you in, in November with the, uh, the driveway text amendment where you're going to increase our driveway widths. Um, I think the, the final was 40, feet. was 40 feet and also to reduce um, the side setback from, uh, for a driveway to come into um, from 10 feet to 5 feet. Um, so a little background on this. Um, this came to our attention probably in the spring of last year where site plans were submitted and approved with 24-foot driveways. 24-foot driveway is our the, the maximum um, driveway width that the county will allow. Um, and um, the site plans were submitted and approved with a 24 foot. This is consistent with the DOT standard of 24 feet. Um, during um, the inspection process and the CO process for some homes in windswept pines, our building inspectors noticed that these driveways were exceeding that width. Um, uh, we were contacted DOT, you have, you have the email chain where you know, this process started back in May. Um, one of the remedies for this situation, the, the property owners did not want to, to rectify the, the, the actual width of the driveways, so another remedy is a text amendment to, to change our standard. Um, and that's what it was presented to you at the November meeting. Um, and I think you all asked for follow-up information from DOT and how, how would this impact um, roads being or being taken over by DOT. What is their standard? Um, there was a lot of, I don't say confusion, but maybe um, just some misunderstanding of what is a case-by-case -case basis, what really is DOT standard, because we were 24 feet was the standard, but maybe they would um, approve something larger on a case-by-case -case basis. And the planning board had a lot of questions that, that we couldn't answer, planning staff couldn't answer. Um, we reached out to DOT staff to get some input from them, uh, and you all have that information from uh, Division I, uh, Mr. David Otts, um, for that. And essentially, and I'm going to paraphrase that, uh, is that 24 feet is the division standard, is DOT standard for driveway width. This is driveway width at the property line. Um, it can flare out from the, what we call an apron from the, the property line to where it intersects with the, the street pavement. Once it's about 10 feet back, it can widen. The driveway can widen. It doesn't have to stay 24 feet the whole way um, as long as it meets that 10-foot setback, which is uh, from the side property line. So the driveway doesn't necessarily have to be 24 feet the whole way, just at the property line. Um, so he did verify that their standard is 24 feet in that email um, and that um, we do allow, a, we, in the ordinance there can be deviations from that standard, um, but that would be DOT making a finding that it's not going to impact access control and the intent of our ordinance. Um, we have not had a chance to work with DOT to make that finding. Um, I went through that, the, the progression of this case with you all in the work session. Um, so at this point, um, you all have the, the information from DOT, and if you would like me to further go into that, I'd be welcome to, but 
uh, if you guys have any questions at this point for planning staff. Who was the first house approved, um, given a certificate of occupancy with a driveway violation? When was the first house that had a drive, whether it was before or after, first house that had a violation that received the certificate of <clears throat> occupancy? I'm not sure which um, the first house was. Um, if you give me a few minutes, I'll search through my emails for the, the list of the homes where we've noted that. That date is kind of important for my kind of processing this and all the emails. Right. I'm, I'm, if my memory serves me correct, I think it was first brought to our attention in late April, which then proceeded with the, the mid-May outreach to uh, NCDOT so that oh. they were notified of, of the violation. So but I don't have, I don't have okay. a list verified in front of me. Because the email chains, it's, there's a long date of email chains. I'm trying to kind of put that together. And the applicant may have uh, that, that specific date of when those plans were approved and when they were issued the COs. I see that in um, May 14th, uh, Mr. Bissell reached out to Randy Midget um, asking for information about the width of the 24-foot driveways and about that deviation language, um, which, again, more emails went back and forth um, May 14th, actually, where it was a generic answer, and then he came back and said, well, you know, you got to make sure that, you know, everybody works together on that. Am I... Which exactly? You know, which what I'm trying to understand is there's a question that actually is that is submitted on May 14th, and the question. Um, yeah, they say the for the lot at 24 at Windswept Pines has been poured at 30 feet wide to access a three-car garage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it says, is there something that NC, NC uh, DOT will, is this something that the NC DOT will approve? This is a street that NC DOT will be petitioned to take after the, take after the subdivision is built out. And then May 15th, Randy Midget responds, since it is a single residential driveway, it would not require a driveway permit from the department. However, if we were reviewing it as a permitted driveway, the department would allow it at 30 feet in this location. Okay. So, and that's where I'm trying to say, okay, how many certificate of occupancies were issued prior to or after that? Because could it be that certificates were issued that that could have been what they call, he may have thought that, you know, the buy-in was the county was okay with that, and they just kept going. And nothing really transpired until after November 13th. So November 13th, there was a lot of houses that were built in and those driveways. So November 13th, we see that more emails pick up. Is there anything between that that's going on with um, communication? 
with 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 DOT. There were there. Um, there no, is a with the county, with the county and um, the the builder or Mr. Bissell. Um, yes, we we did issue notice of violations to those property owners, to those seven, and I'm in the middle of uh, trying to pull that those emails up. Um, and then the one remedy is is to bring compliance as far as create the 24 foot driveway width to to make to ensure that it's 24 feet at the property line. Um, the property owners did not pursue that option. Another option then would be to have a text amendment. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, They're the only two options we have. Well, uh, as we talked in in, in the work session, um, there there is a process for a variance. Um, however, I don't think all eight of these driveways would qualify for a variance. We have standards for variances, um, and, and variances are supposed to be very um, rigorous. The, the standards for, var for a variance is very rigorous, and it, if you're going to issue a variance for something um, like a driveway width, it should be very specific to one piece of, of property. Um, so uh, in, in my opinion, they, these eight driveways would not qualify uh, for meet the variance standards. Like we're back to it should be very specific to one individual. Um, so either you bring compliance to the standard or, or you change the standard. Um, and the applicant chose to go the route to change the standard. The email received from David Otis on um, January 3rd, uh, he's from DOT, correct? Um, he actually said that um, in this email, he says, Prairie Tuck County's current UDO section 567 is consistent with our policy for one-way operation driveways with a maximum of 24 feet. We would consider a residential driveway a one-way, as noted in our guidelines. Exceptions may be considered on a case-to-case -case basis only after justification of actual necessity. As noted in the Curry Tug County's UDO, Part F of the aforementioned section, deviations may be approved by DOT upon finding the development can achieve a satisfactory level of access control consistent with the objectives of this ordinance. Accordingly, it seems that two governing entities working together can approve individual over with driveways as long as the owner can approve a need and an access control can be kept at an accept accessible level. Now we're also saying that you haven't had a chance to make those findings. Should we, we have not received? Should we consider that we go down the avenue of trying to see if each individual can try to meet that burden? Um, that would be a, a deviation if, if DOT could make the findings that those eight driveways uh, that there's. Um, once again, uh, how did he put it? Necessity. Um, so, um, and, and that they, that the the homeowners or the applicant presents whatever nece information necessary to DOT for them to make the findings, so that you know we could then approve those deviations. Is that possible? That is possible. Or er, um, earlier, um, those findings were. Um, we we asked for those findings for the, for DOT to make such a finding if we were to do this, um, but in this email now, David Ott seems to be open to to discussing a way forward with those eight driveways. Um, I, I, I guess you know my control my concern is changing the um, obviously in his email if we were to vote on 40 foot driveways there's a real strong chance that these roads don't get taken over because it exceeds DOT standards, um, or rather, it exceeds DOT's regulations. Um, so I'm not sure that's even really a, a 
option for us? Um, it would be concerning as, as someone, as the planning director of Craig Tuck County, yes, I am very concerned that, you know, that would, that would then hinder these roads in any future streets where, um, in any future subdivisions where there's, you know, these larger driveways um, from DOT taking over the roads. Because um, that would eventually, um, it would go back on a, the property owner and homeowners association to then have to maintain their roads. Right. And that's an extra burden on them. <coughs> and we, we certainly don't want to so what you're, let me get straight what you're asking. Would I'm, I'm asking, the county be willing to work with DOT to do what he's described in his email for those eight houses instead of passing the tax amendment? That's what I'm looking at. I would make a motion, a motion to take no action on this request me. to amend Chapter 5 until DOT reviews each existing over with driveway at Windswept Primes and provide comments to the county as to their acceptability, both in regards to necessity and providing adequate access control. That's what I would look at. I, I hate to see a burden be put on homeowners. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what took place here. I have a feeling that really it was just the ball was kind of dropped everywhere. Um, and I, I personally feel that it's my, this is my personal, that there looks like a window of opportunity to resolve this without us having to really do anything. If we could get DOT to make those findings to have work with either the applicant or the property owners um, for them to make that, um, for them to present the information that DOT needs to make that finding, um, that's... And he actually did also put a another great um, uh, sentence in here for future over with driveways in this subdivision it should be submitted and approved by both the county and the department prior to construction. So he's actually not even put a closed door on future over with driveways mm -hmm. as long as it's, it's pre-determined before submission of the uh, application. Am I, am I interpreting this wrong? No, I shouldn't say it should be. It needs to be, not should. I'm just reading what he said. Yeah, I, and, I, and I don't agree with the way you, that's written. But we have a standard of 24, and I think we need to stay with that standard. If they want to widen out to 30, 36, 10 feet back, I get that because they got a three-car garage, and that's that's fine. But you can't do you can't do 36, 38, 48. But at the, if at the DOT road, DOT is willing. Why do we care if DOT is willing to take over the roads? If they, they can yet. approve this again, he's saying future over with driveways of the subdivision should be submitted. So if the builder, the homeowner, everybody takes the time to get that approval and the roads will be taken over, why Why do we just have to be so rigid? They would have to show a need at that's that point. Right. That's right. That's not our... Aren't that's we still going to have drainage if, issues? If DOT... Again, that's going to that's be prior DOT. to... Uh, everything will be, be prior to... We wouldn't even be here if this was all put... This shouldn't even... This, let me ask you this, though. Our um, vote on the text amendment has no bearing whatsoever on what these homeowners can do later. I mean, if we if we vote to to go ahead and not yeah, pass this text amendment amendment to go ahead and leave the UDO as it is, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. These homeowners can still petition no. the DOT. I mean, the, we're leaving the we're leaving the the UDO the same, right? Well, I mean, fines are going to kick in though. We got to discuss what's going to happen with right. fines. But so, if we make a motion to allow the time to take place for each and individual, I think, but because there are fines that are going to kick in, we have to make a motion that at least well, as as the text amendment process has been started. And um, there's no resolution to this yet. Um, I mean, that's what we're voting on. That's what you're voting on. You're voting on to change, yes. Not remedies, not 
So can I make a motion? But we could include that? a remedy in the motion, yeah, and it would just it? be a suggestion to the commissioners of. So we can just recommend that. We as could decide to. You could. So we in essence, if I'm hearing what this correctly, you could deny the tax amendment with a recommendation that the county and DOT work together to alleviate the situation for these eight homeowners. And those eight homeowners would essentially become a non-conforming use, I guess. And it would be up to the commissioners at that point of whether they want to move forward with our recommendation or do something different. That way you can... Is that... Well, visually, a possibility like saying, yeah. DOT could, yeah. could do that. Yeah, each, I mean, because, each. Yeah. 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 That sounds good. I mean, somebody want to talk on this? We would be denying the tax amendment with the recommendation that uh, for the eight houses that have already been o issued occupancy, that uh, the county and DOT work together to find a solution or get those in a case-by-case -case basis approved if they say they have to change something it may come up I guess where it has to be changed or it. I mean as far as we know it may come up where DOT may find one of them or not I mean it really so that's that's what I'm hearing okay is that <laughs> so the text amendment process has started they're they're seeking a remedy mm -hmm. um, and the the planning board is a, recomm a recommending board. Your your board, you, you make the recommendation to the board of commissioners, and then the board of commissioners will then act on that recommendation at their um, meeting in February. Uh, because the, the, um, at that time they can alleviate the fines, or not that there's any fines accrued at this point, but they can give essentially a stay while DOT. They have that authority. Um, so. I think that's what we're looking at. Yeah. Okay. Is that is <laughs> uh, oh, does anybody want to speak? Well, I don't know if you would like to we're speak with yet. the, the, to give the applicant a chance to, yes, to speak. We will. Okay, I'm sorry. I, we just didn't. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're getting there. We were just <laughs> discussing possibilities. Making sure what we're talking about is something we can actually do, I guess. But uh, are, are you okay with us opening? Go ahead and hear from. Okay. If you at this point, if you don't have any more questions for staff, I think anybody um, have any any other questions? <laughs> uh, first, we would hear from the applicant, and then open the public comment for uh, anyone else to speak. So first, is there anyone here to represent for the applicant tonight? Uh, yes, I'm Mark Thistle. And um, the only thing I would add to what you or, or suggest on along, and I think you're okay. going in the right direction with this, but I would ask that uh, if you would be willing to consider uh, postponing the making of the motion for denial and just kind of tabling this until we find out if DOT is willing to approve these existing driveways so that you don't close a door that might otherwise be, be available to these people to find another solution in the event that they're not successful with DOT. We were going to ask the commissioners to do the stay instead of us if well, not it, it, See, I, I is there no action right now. is there if we could do the, that as here at this level as well i guess uh, right. there's so some concern the, the opportunity to I, further amend the proposal i didn't know we've amendment. we've already delayed it at this level three times if and so I, for your sake and the other homeowners' sakes, I didn't know I, if we needed to move that forward. I think you've only actually tabled it one time, and that might be 
all you can do. I don't know that you can. it once, and we we just didn't bring it back. It from the withdrew the next it from time, the agenda. So I don't know that you can table it again. But I've, I've got the UDO up, and I'm. I'm yeah, she's checking. <laughs> But regardless, we were going to ask for that same scenario, whether it's here or at the commissioner level. Well, the, the scenario I'd like to avoid is if DOT, maybe on one of the eight or two of the eight or whatever, decides, well, this doesn't really meet the standard. And you know, we, we, we have a stay in place, but now the, the stay is until DOT makes their finding, and if DOT's finding is not favorable to that property owner, then somehow the process has to start over again if they know if this section is not still in play. Mr. Bissell, do you have access to the email received from David Otis on Friday, January 3rd? Have you received a copy of that? I have read it, yes. Um, there is a concern at the 40-foot driveway um, that roads don't get taken over, so that is a concern. You may have to and, come and back discussion anyway. And discussion implications are that they would be accepted in this case, but would like, as he indicated further, um, certainly to have driveways approved in the future prior to them being constructed rather than 24 feet. Um, we believe that DOT will accept these. We don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. How far are you away from petitioning DOT for the entire subdivision? Uh, it's probably several months away. Okay. <coughs> but certainly we would want DOT to give us a give us a nod that they will accept these roads at the time that they make the finding on these driveways. Uh, and, and we're not far away, actually, I don't think from actually issuing a uh, uh, petition in DOT to uh, accept phase one. In this I didn't know if we could include uh, everything into one. Well, the problem is that we don't, that the petition and acceptance process, uh, particularly the schedule for that, is something that's really difficult to tie down these days. We, have a couple of petitions that have been in place since last summer, and to my knowledge, DOT hasn't completed their site inspection yet. They're just very busy. They're, they're bogged down. You've clumped together the um, agenda with Chapter 5 and Chapter 3. Chapter 3, asking to reduce the driveway setback from side property lines to 5 feet as opposed to the current requirement of 10 feet. Why? Why were they lumped Why are the you, same why are you asking? Is there a current violation that you're looking at? There, there are a number of violations of side setbacks that uh, we're looking at as well. Uh, one in Winstrup Pines, a couple in, in some in other subdivisions. Um, that arrived, I think, in a manner that's kind of similar to this one, where TOs were issued and, and violations were discovered after the fact, where people had built their driveways too close to the side property line. There were a couple of cases of those where the garages were actually added behind the houses and then driveways put in to access those garages and those driveways. Then Did they get the permits? Did they get permits for that? They got permits for the garages. I, I, I'm not familiar with uh, all these cases on the, on how the garages are constructed. So a couple of those properties <coughs> here tonight, but I'm <coughs> sure can explain a little bit more on that. But what we were in further discussions on that one, I, and you didn't really have any discussion on that earlier, but uh, in further discussion with staff on that. Uh, we've been dis discussing the idea of doing those on a case-by-case -case basis where uh, an engineering analysis would be provided to the county 
and the county engineer would have an opportunity to review those on a case-by-case -case basis to make a finding that they would not be interfering with the, the drainage system on those particular lots and allowing those to be approved in that matter rather than making it broader like it is in the text amendment. Yeah. So we, we, you could actually leave it at, at the 10 feet and, or uh, leave it at the 10 feet and you guys could work that out with engineering? Well, no, I think the text amendment, I think there would have to be a text amendment to allow that to be approved. That's I correct. Like these basis. And the setback has nothing to do with DOT. That has nothing to do with it's a separate. Right. So that this yeah. So these should actually be separate. They should be separate. Brought to us separately. So I think if we can't table again, I think we need to deny it and do what you're saying, and go with the DOT and the and the commissioners, and let them do that case by case. You you can make different recommendations for each part of the text amendment. Just to you, remind you. Could you could actually divide it up. Or we could. We haven't received a lot of information on that second part. Um, I mean, we're, we have a lot of information on the driveway, but we don't have much information on the. Um, the yeah, I, mean, I believe Mr. Eric Weatherly is here to discuss that a little further at some point when you're ready. All right. That's all the questions. Anyway, I would, I would encourage you to, to consider um, the second part of that amendment in a modified form to allow those on a case-by-case -case basis with concurrence from the county engineer. I think she's checking to see if we can. Uh, so we'll have to get back with you on that in a minute. but. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for Mr. Bissell? No. Nope. Okay. I'll now open the floor for public comment. Is there anyone present who wishes to speak on the item tonight? And I've got a couple people signed up here. Number one is Keith Blaine. If you'd like to come on. Are you here to speak on this item or something different? Okay, sorry, just making sure. Good evening. Uh, my name is Keith Blaine. I live at uh, 109 uh, Hidden View Loop in Moyot Crossing. Uh, we purchased the house in... Uh, May of 19, uh, excuse me, 20, uh, 1980, 19, uh, 2018. Um, and uh, before we purchased the house, um, we had to go with the developer to make sure that we could put a two-car garage and uh, you know, a driveway access into the side of the house, uh, which everything was uh, okay with them. I had drawings and approval plus the HOA. And then in uh, November of last year, year before, excuse me, uh, we got approval for uh, a two-car garage back behind the house on the property line. After we got that uh, approved, we built the, the garage and then put in the driveway after the garage was built. Now, this is not affecting the one that you have on the amendment, but they were, we're looking for... Um, a variation into the 10-foot easement down to 5 foot because when they put in the driveway, the people that put in the concrete driveway for us told us that it was only 5 feet, so we're actually uh, four and a half feet over into the 10-foot uh, property line with the concrete driveway, and that's why we were uh, summoned uh, with the uh, citation for uh, exceeding into the uh, easement area. If I don't, if I if I had known that, I don't know what I would have done uh, you know, with purchasing the house. But the, I have it. I have a uh, two-car garage and a driveway. If I have to cut, I won't have a driveway. Um, and uh, approval for the 
easement area from 10 feet to 5 feet would actually alleviate uh, uh, the problem that I had. Um, we tried putting in to, uh, a, uh, a variation through Mr. Literal uh, when we did this, and we talked to the young lady also, and they said you could put one in, pay you $500, but it won't get approved. So we really have no option here. We have a driveway and like 20 feet of no man's land that we can't use, 10 feet on our side and 10 feet on the uh, other side of the uh, property. So there's 20 feet that we really can't utilize, and I can't use the driveway without cutting it short. So I have uh, a garage that I can't use uh, because of this, and I, I would not have known uh, otherwise until after we put this thing in. Uh, so I'm, t I'm here um, hoping that uh, we can get uh, uh, an approval f uh, from the uh, text amendment Mr. Bissell put in uh, to take and make it uh, countywide to go from 10 feet to the 5 feet. Uh, again, we are in an area which has no we have sewage, county sewage, and drainage in there, so uh, there's only a small swale running in between in the back, and there's no uh, utilities in this area whatsoever. And all the utilities in our area are in the front, uh, so it doesn't impact anything. Um, our driveway goes, does not uh, come out to the front uh, easement line. It goes at an angle. Uh, into the side of the garage and then uh, side of the house and that's when it runs into the uh, over into the, uh, the current 10 foot easement. So that's, uh, I mean, she, they had a photograph of that, I drive there too. Yes, <coughs> yeah. Which photo is that? Um, this is 109 on, uh, <coughs> on Hidden View. I don't think it's in there or pack it. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. It's not in the packet. Just before page 29. Yeah, I think it's one of those photographs either on the front or the back of that. Oh. Mm -hmm. like See, like one. two feet or that one. Uh, yes, that's it. It's you can see one. the garage. You can see the garage uh, open in the back. Yeah. And, uh, and how it goes down to the side. Okay. I think so, yeah. Has your neighbor complained about no, any? No, ma'am, we have not. Uh, we went through the HOA and everything else like that, uh, and we had no complaints with uh, any of the uh, people alongside of us or anything like that. Uh, even the H HOA approved it uh, as well as the, uh, the builders. So we went through everything except uh, when we did the uh, garage bit uh, to the county and then the driver, that's when we had it, said we had a problem. So. Yeah, because of the setback. Now, your garage back there, is that 10 feet off? It is. It is 10 feet off. That is, that is so it. So your contractor who did the concrete we, should have known what the setback two was. People, two different people did it. The people who built the garage did not do the driveway. The other concrete people did the driveway. And when we asked him about the permits and stuff like that, he, saw, he told us that the, uh, the, the easement line was five feet. Uh, I didn't... I didn't which that. he was mistaken. Yeah, it's a, it's a heavy mistake. Huh? But, um, but, either, but either way, I've got a garage that I wouldn't be able to use with a driveway. I mean, because they said that you can't uh, use any gravel. I talked with, had a long talk with Mr. Literal uh, when we got, we got the summons. Uh, how, how wide is that driveway going back? Uh, it's 12 feet. 12 feet. And it's off the house, it looks maybe two feet, foot and a half? About a foot and a half, I believe it is. And the reason we did that was because of the uh, access to the power mm -hmm. cable right there, so we didn't go out directly to the house. Is there any standing water there when it rains? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, there's, there's that little ditch, as you can see on the, uh, in the center there, uh, that divides uh, 
the two houses, but there was no standing water. We have we have pretty good drainage. In fact, I was up here for the hurricane, and everything went down the uh, the street, uh, and then it didn't really run off anywhere. And of course, uh, the concrete um, it, it did come off. You know, some did come off the concrete as as normal, but it's uh, it's slanted. If you look at it, it's slanted down. Uh, I think to come to the street side anyway. Well, and on the side of the house, it's shedding off to the grant where it's supposed to, away from the house. Yes, sir. Gloria, how many of these are we looking at? Like this kind of issue? Is it all over the place? I mean, <coughs> there's three people uh, I know in our section that have the same uh, problem. Uh, Mr. Brook is here tonight, and there's another gentleman uh, who didn't come, but I, I do know from talking with other people that there is other uh, communities that are, are experiencing the same thing with this 10-foot, 5-foot, or 10-foot easement, which is impacting on how they can do things. I'm not sure how many have got uh, citations in there. there and I think it would be like a case-by-case -case thing, but I mean, there's a reason that that's in place, the 10-foot easement. It's there for a reason. So, I mean, if you're over the easement, like you said, it's going to be a case-by-case -case thing, I guess. There, there are a number a number of these violations. Um, I mean, would you be going all over town checking these out? I mean, I... It, it, well, it, would, de it would depend. If, if, first of all, if we got a complaint, or, once again, these are new construction, so we are out there seeing, seeing this. Um, we would not allow anyone to come in and ask for a permit to do something into that setback. Um, we, unless we get a complaint, we're not going to go out into an older neighborhood um, and look for these because, you know, the, the standard may have been different. Um, you know, we were talking how this essentially came out of like a 2005 text amendment. Well, there were plenty of homes and subdivisions in place prior to 2005. If we got a complaint that something was new and got too close to the setback, that would be one thing. Um, but right. as far as going out on existing neighborhoods, because then we would have to see when the building was done, see if we can figure out if the driveway was put in, what ordinance was in effect at that time. Um, once again, this is really, unfortunately, geared toward new construction, um, okay. where, where these these matters are, are, are we're seeing them come up during during our inspection process. And that's why we have standards. So, so now, basically, I mean, could it be when um, people like a general homeowner who doesn't know this, when he goes in to submit an application, should the driveway plan be on there so that he, so, I mean, so should, should a driveway plan be on there so that the homeowner knows that, hey, you got setbacks you should be adhering to? Well, we do require, uh, in most instances, we do, in all instances, we do require a, a site plan of what um, a homeowner or a property owner or anyone's going to want to do on, on their property. Um, sometimes it's it's better than others. You know, sometimes it's a survey engineered site plan, depending on, on the level of what it is. Um, um, with new construction, typically, we have a very good site plan um, surveyed out very well especially with smaller lots. Um, and, and this is how we, we've noticed some of these come in for other things and, and we have, they have an as-built showing or a, or a site plan showing driveways that are too close or buildings that are too close. And <coughs> we can't issue a new permit for a property that's in violation. So in 2005, though, the setback was how much? <laughs> Ten feet. What was it before okay. 2005? You see, this is after the fact. This this, yeah. this whole thing is yeah. after yeah. the yeah. Just time. Yeah, just wondering. 2005. It was still 10 feet in 2005? <coughs> before the text amendment changed. So it's never really changed. Was a building permit right issued right. for this right. garage? Yes. I, mean, yeah, I have that here. And do you have this, this 
would he have done a, I don't know, you said a, site, a site work plan? or something? Yeah, they that would have done a site plan. would have shown where the driveway would be? No. Nope. Would, it, would it have been there? If I'm remembering this one correctly, I believe that the there was a building on the site plan and there was no driveway connection drawn on the site plan to it at that time. It got approved and constructed and then, and if I'm correct, that the driveway was added after the fact. Well, the, uh, so, can, what the, uh, the house was built and the, dry, I mean, the garage was uh, built by uh, uh, the builder, uh, not the builder, the state line. Um, State line. State line. State line builders. And they put it in, and it was approved before it, so they had to build it. And then the inspectors came out, because I was there and I saw it, and, and there was nothing wrong uh, with the, uh, the, the garage. Mm -hmm. And then after the garage was built, then we had uh, the concrete people put uh, the driveway in. But that's, uh, that's where But did the site plan include the driveway when you, you I, got the approval for I the don't garage? Know, so because uh, we, we had the driveway put in after the thing was built. I don't know when it was put on the plan. Uh, I don't believe that there was a driveway on the site plan of this one. Um, so after yeah. it was approved. After it was approved and, and, the, and the accessory building, the garage got its final inspection. Yeah. And I don't even know if you have to get the driveway approved as long as you stay within the, the these are the 10 feet in. Right. Well, te is technically, there, you need a zoning is there permit for that. Ability for um, a permeable driveway, something that is like pavers or something to that, um, to keep that setback. Because your your condition, sir, looks like okay. You have approval, but as going down the line, bringing it to five feet for you know, setback for other people, there could be factors that play that, you know, if we change it for here, we're changing the whole dynamics of the entire county of people who are possibly building in those setbacks that, I, I'm not an engineer, and I, I do want to hear from the engineer about this. Um, I'm not an engineer, but, you know, you know, could that cause problems for your neighbor? Your situation may not. It may, you know, it's a shame that you can't go on a case-by-case -case basis, but, I mean, it could be, you know, it could be an issue for somebody else in another neighborhood that we make all the Currituck County change in them all to side setbacks to, to five feet could be a problem. For others, while it's not a problem for you, it may be a problem going down the line for flooding. I feel for you. you. Um, I, is there a possibility of a permeable driveway? To, to my knowledge, we have some allowance for that as a way to deal with lot coverage, pervious surface issues, but not for setbacks. And but I can. We can ask Eric about that, but I, I believe that's how it works currently in the ordinance. The coverage would help the lot coverage, but it wouldn't do anything for the easement. You're still in the... You're still in the setback. Yeah, you're still in the... As Mr. Bissell, I think, mentioned a while ago, if... Uh, I may have misunderstood that. Uh, submitting on a case-by-case -case basis for the setback situation an engineered report showing you're not going to flood your neighbor you're not going to do any harm could something like that fly um that was something i would like for eric weatherly the county engineer to for you to ask him um if it's an i mean instead of us just saying that we're changing the setback from 10 foot to five foot that it would remain 10 foot it could be less than to five foot if you submit this engineered plan uh, letter from an engineer saying that you're not going to flood your neighbor by putting this driveway in. By being within that 10 foot easement. By taking up that extra five foot. 
once again, I, this would be something that, I, I, you know, if, if we could have um, Eric Weatherly um, speak to here in, in a few minutes, that would be. Um, mm -hmm. That's Eric. That Eric mm -hmm. and, okay. um, I'm not an and I may have misunderstood that, but I thought that's what he said. Uh, well, what's your opinion? Do you, is, is it possible to have a case? <coughs> case? I mean, <coughs> I, I think changing it to, um, well, I don't know. I, 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 my concern is we brought it to the attention so feuding neighbors could actually cause issues with each other. Sure. Sure. Um, I would be hesitant to to on a, on a case by case basis um, uh, who, who qualifies on a case by case basis um, and this report the criteria for that um, I, I would or back to I would defer to Eric Weatherly and his um, department's workload to um, to review the engineered uh, report um, you know for every single residential lot that may want to encroach into that setback. Um, they have several projects going on, you know, and that's something that I would like to. I would defer to Mr. Weatherly to answer. Um, and and, and if issues when people move. Exactly. Yeah, when yeah. a new homeowner comes <coughs> in, your neighbor may not have a problem with it now. Mm -hmm. But when that neighbor sells that house and they find out that a driveway is encroached into their easement, there can be an issue then. Mm -hmm. Well, it's mm -hmm. not their easement, it's encroached into but a neighbor can have a problem, you know, with that. His neighbor has no problem right now, but if his neighbor moves, the next one might. And the guy might live right down the street. Unless I we, want this house born. I'm like, hey, we why are you in my yard? Feet and then but by changing it to yeah. five but feet, so we're going higher to, density then, development. Then what's going to what happen, doing. though? We give five feet, somebody's going to go into the five foot easement. We keep it at ten. And then the next thing you know. We don't change it. Yeah, it's just more and more concrete. Right. All right. Does anyone else have any questions for Mr. Blaine? No, but Mr. Weatherly, I do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We've got Al Brook. Are you here to <coughs> speak on this item? Yes, sir. All right. My name is uh, Al Brook. I live at 114 Hidden View Loop. And I was cited with a, a violation on September the 11th for a driveway I extended back to my <coughs> detached garage. Uh, I do have a permit that was approved for the garage. And uh, I put in the driveway. The only approvals I had were for the HOA at that point. I'll give you a little history on this. Before I, uh, the house was built, I went with the builder to review the way the house was set on the lot. And when the, uh, the original plan showed the lot on that side being only 15 feet from the uh, boundary line, I had to move it over to 15 feet. So I knew, because I knew I was going to put a driveway in going back to the garage. So I meet the setback requirement. Uh, when this violation came out, uh, Miss Anderson came out, and I talked with her. And it looks at the way the, uh, I don't know if y'all have a picture of my lot. I brought it with me. I don't know if y'all have it in there. That is there. Would you like to see this? Yeah, I would. The, uh, when Ms. Anderson came out, we, uh, I pulled the line between my boundary markers on that side of the house and measured over to uh, where the driveway is. I'm in an infraction of 16 inches on just part of that driveway as it comes up and makes the curve around. That one curve right there just extends over 16 inches into that. Uh, but you're in a lot of shape. It ties inches, out. That's it. And 16 in inches. I'm you're approaching 16 inches. That's 16. That's right. Okay. Just in one little spot, too. In one spot. It, one is spot. it possible to rectify that? The other way, I would have to tear out the driveway and move it over towards the house. Now, I don't know if that is a violation of any codes that goes in closer to the house on that front part of the garage. You just got that corner on it. 
You couldn't just cut that corner off the 16 inches? Well, it didn't reduce the width of my driveway to what? To get back from 12 feet to basically 10 and a half feet. Okay. Which is wide enough for a car. Well, when you're trying to back into there, if you're doing a trailer backing into that, it's not wide enough, no. Because you've got to make that, that turn. Well, what if you were to cut it and then put pavers in? I, and I don't mean to say I don't, here say I don't think ifs. that beats the code because you cannot put any solid object in there. Uh, it still falls in the same criteria of being an encroachment. <laughs> He's correct if it's used as a driveway. It could be a It doesn't matter what the surface material is. What I'm trying to avoid too, uh, uh, it would uh, the aesthetics, the way it looks, the way I would have to change it, would alter it quite a bit. The way it looks from the uh, front of the house, from the uh, curb appeal. So the concrete on that uh, radius, you're saying, is into the easement. Correct. So the fence is definitely in the easement. Yeah, I understand. There's no issues with that. I don't go all the way to the boundary line. I just go into the easement on that, knowing full well that if they have to go in and move it, I agree with that. Yeah. But I think he's correct. The fence is not an issue. Is yeah, it? fences are permitted all the way up to the property line. And the only thing is that five-foot text amendment on there would fully suit my needs whatsoever. A two-foot text amendment would suit me just fine. That's only one individual place that I understand that. But I'm just appealing. I know that if I try to get a variance on this, it costs me $500. Yeah, that's it all the way down. Right there. It's going to cost me a lot more than that to uh, rectify it. If I have to I'm not arguing that. We've been spending quite a bit of time on trying to come up with a solution for you, so we're we're working. Appreciate it. We're working on it, uh, but as Ms. Kraus uh, pointed out, we we anything we do is countywide, so we have to take that into consideration of what effects that may cause that somewhere else. All right. Well, thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Mr. Brooke? No encouragement. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm not sh I've got two more people signed up, but I don't know if you're here to speak on this item or not. Is there anyone else here to speak on this item? Come on up. Are you Michael? Yes. All right. Come on up. State your name and address for the record, please. Okay, I'm uh, Michael Ranke. This is my wife, uh, Lisa Ranke. We are at 121 Parish Point Lane, and we're speaking to the first part of that, which is the driveway driveway widths. Okay. Um, uh, we closed on our home March 21st of last year. Uh, obviously, these emails started coming out in May, and our neighbor closed on November 8th of 2018. There are eight of us that are in this situation. Okay, so we went with the builder, we went through all the permitting processes with them. Um, we were issued certificates of occupancy after numerous, numerous inspections on the property. I don't know what you expect me to do at this point. We, we, this, is, this was an allowable option for us, it was put in. I don't know what you're really expecting me to do with the property there going forward. We didn't create the issue. We weren't the problem. We are asking you to correct this, whether it's grandfathering us in for those properties, making them go through the painstaking process with DOT to get them approved in the future. But we did not cause the issue. We did not ask for the issue. We're asking you to resolve the issue. And I, I don't think it's fair on us having absolutely nothing to do with what occurred to, to do something different for, for a problem we did, we did not cause, quite, quite frankly. And that's why we are asking for this to be resolved and not push it farther. Additionally, we have neighbors that have already paid for pools, paid for sheds to go in, paid in full,
people to do things. Their permits are getting held up because this can keeps getting kicked down the road. And, and again, I say, I, I don't know how it's any fault of our own. We're asking you to correct the issue. And I guess what to further his point, on our particular stance, we have a three-car garage. They said, you can have this driveway. We said, okay. And now if we are forced to go in 10 feet, we won't be able to get a car into that third car garage. And so it's just, I guess, the same thing. We just want help figuring out how to get to that point where, whether it's some way to grandfather us eight in that didn't know, or whether it's a text amendment to change the width, because it was my understanding, speaking with another builder, that they would, and CDOT does routinely take neighborhoods over that have driveways over 40 feet. So. If, if it's finding out further confirmation from NCDOT that they will, yes, take it, then then to say that's okay. And I mean, and then to your question, I think you had asked about certificates of occupancy. I know the first house, one of the first houses of the eight that has the violation did close November of 2018 of when, for how long this had had gone on. But we, yeah, we closed in March and then this started in May. And now so we're 2018? just- 2018? Mm-hmm. And we are just trying to figure out how to get to some solutions so that if we someday want to put in a shed, we can, because right now we're in violation and we can't get the permit, even if we wanted to. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not on a main road. Right. Okay, there are, there's no road. problem there's with the access points. We have great drainage in our neighborhoods. There are no neighbors complaining about it. And it keeps, we have a teenage daughter. It keeps our cars all off of the road so that Correct. the road is free so we can actually park the why we put a third car garage in so just we are trying to rectify this we are definitely I mean, we have sent this back several times um and again we're trying to find out what, what else we can do but um if we change the udo to 40 foot driveways that could pose a problem future yeah, um, how did we get certificates of occupancy in that it's case not, we're, we're, that's, that's where so, we're that's where so, we're trying to see how we could work it, this out is there and, an option is there something that exists that that allows the eight like a grandfather that would allow the eight to stay that are already in um According to the DOT um, David Otts from uh, division one um, working with working with the property owners and like I said, whatever information they need to verify that that this is a need, um, and that you're not that the accessibility that the um, access standards could still be met, um, then we could have deviations from that. Um, so, and I think that was the indication that the planning board would like to see um, us working with them. And we we have been trying to reach out to them about this um, because they're the ones who will be taking this over. Uh, I can definitely give you this, the copy of the email from, from DOT that, uh, although I'm, I'm sh you're, you know that the builders have said that DOT has taken roads over with 40-foot driveways, um, the email that we received indicated that it, it may be an issue for them if, like, several numerous driveways in a neighborhood exceeded, you know, their standard, because their standard is 24. They do allow deviations on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, however, those case-by-case -case basis should have been done prior to, um, and, you know, there is that standard in place. There was a site plan that showed a 24-foot or smaller driveway. That site plan was approved, so um, <coughs> there's, there's that issue that, you know, the site plan wasn't adhered to by, by someone. Right. Yeah, I mean, we understand that, and we get that, and, and it's just unfortunate. It's so, hard being the homeowner, and it wasn't we didn't choose it, do it, or, or break any rule, but now we're the one who have this stuff with this. Do we have a picture of your driveway here? I or? don't know if you do. It's 121. We have four pictures. Uh, I mean, that's a, like the widest one I have right there. No, our house is too Oh, is it? Okay. I understand having a three-car garage, but I mean, like this here, if you have 40 feet or so, say, come in 24, and you come in, and you can make it as wide as you want to. to how far off the road is your house? 
like, like, like these. Jason, is that picture? That's not there. Yeah, that's not our, it's not even our floor plan. None of those are our floor plans. Well, in, in, in like we said a minute ago, it, it, it may not actually be labeled as grandfathered, but that's kind of where we're headed to trying to find out a solution for the eight homeowners that we have the per problem with the permits. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working on it. We're, we're, I know we've held it up quite a few times, but keep in mind we've done that right. to try to help you guys and find a solution. Right. That's so we're, I know it's frustrating, but we are trying to work through it. Uh, and it's going to require cooperation with DOT and the staff in the process. So. Um, we may end up doing a case-by-case -case basis with DOT on the driveways that may require some some more information on your part to them. But uh, we'll get there at DOT's pace, I'm assuming. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else? <clears throat> Mr. Bissell, come on up. We're going to give... Eric, a minute too, if you want to let him speak first, or if that's well, I'd just okay. first just like to go back to the <coughs> second part of that for a minute. And, um, and you've heard from a couple of people that that have issues, but you know, there are other issues, there are other people that have similar issues, but they're all a little bit different. Um, so that's kind of why I would encourage you to do something that will allow those to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And the other thing I wanted to point out was that the 10-foot driveway setback is not universal across the county. There are zoning districts that do allow driveways to be closer to property lines than 10 feet. For example, the, the village commercial allows them to be within three feet of the property line. In planned developments, the developer sets their own setbacks so it's obviously been determined that subdivisions can be engineered for drainage to work with driveways and other structures closer than 10 feet to property lines. So that's another point uh, in favor of allowing these to be examined in, in, on a case-by-case -case basis with, the, with an engineered solution. It, was I correct, Balago, in what you had said in submitting an engineered report for someone like Mr. Blaine's driveway, yes, that indicates that the, the that you would that it would not cause any impacting a neighbor. right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Weatherly, you want you want to come on down? Eric Weatherly, County Engineer, Currituck County. Could you just start. Sure. Let us have it. I don't know <coughs> where to start. Um, Is it true what um, Mr. Bissell said that there are in Currituck County other approved driveways that are? less than the 10 foot setback i did not know that but i could understand possibly the commercial and and something like that only where, commercial yeah no residential not, not that i'm aware of no so let me just maybe i can just start thinking out loud and i, I understand what everybody's saying um but these regulations have been in effect for 15 years and it's all of a sudden I've never had issues before um, we've had the 10 foot setbacks um, the driveway widths let me step back again drainage drainage is is a big issue in this county we we are a low coastal county and we are very diverse from Moyoc to the southern end to the beaches. And 
to to change these ordinances to allow within the setbacks is is and to put the responsibility on staff to make these decisions that says okay we will allow this an engineer an engineer is good at working for his client I don't know how to put that but you understand what I'm saying he's going to do a good job and and do whatever he can um, I don't know about the existing driveways and and I understand and I'm willing to to work with those driveways and work with DOT to see what we can do but to just make a text amendment that says now we allow 40 foot driveways I um I, I think about the beach sometimes and the Corolla Bays and the Beacon Villas and they have curb and gutters and others and the Monterey Shores area and somebody builds a driveway across the street and it's sloped and this guy on the other side of the street he's he floods all the time and he watches that driveway being built and all this sheet flow is coming right down on him and he's calling us screaming why did you let that guy build that driveway and could you imagine if it was 40 feet wide the runoff that would go straight into that neighbor's lot now some of these Moyot crossing windswept pines maybe they don't have the issues but I think more globally the setbacks they were developed for drainage we we have poor soils um, the new subdivisions are we uh, we we make them put in lot line swells we are so aware of runoff onto your neighbor it's it's amazing how many complaints we get about runoff from our neighbor or your neighbor you're not even allowed to feel higher than your neighbor without a stormwater plan you're not allowed to do anything within that 10 foot not not a bit of feel i understand the engineered side of it and the lot line swells does intercept that flow think about what if a street like countryside estates has already been accepted by DOT and they go in and put in 40 foot wide driveways or there's so many variables I, I don't even know where to start but I do know if you pass these text amendments and put this onus pretty much on me countywide to make these decisions I do know uh, we would have to somehow develop criteria slope if a drive if a if a lot is is two or three foot lower which is huge in this county than your neighbor and that lower lot says well let me encroach two or three feet well, he's already low. He's not going to run off into his neighbor. But picture it the other way around. So, I'm around. <clears throat> Ask me some questions. But there can be a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, without changing any of this. Uh, yes, I understand Is that, that correct? Sure. Would you support what we were discussing earlier as working out a solution for the eight homeowners Absolutely. as far as the driveway is yes, concerned, sir. but not passing the text amendment? No. <clears throat> Correct. You would support working out something for those eight homeowners? Yes. I don't, what about I don't the, understand. That's, you know, you're, you're, you're getting legal. Sure. May, maybe you should have a an attorney standing up here and answering these questions. I think that'd go before the commissioners. 
I think that's above our pay well, that's grade. That's why we yeah. were going to make the suggestion to the commissioners where the attorney would be present. It, is it, I'm going to step way out of my bounds. Is it county staff to, to determine every time what the laws are and say to prevent? I, I, I'm not that, Maybe. no, I'm going to back up. I don't understand that either. How we are held responsible for violations. How do we know we're where that property line responsible. was? No. I don't think you're responsible. We're not holding. You're not you do a great job. It's 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 not your fault. I think what we're looking at here with these driveways, and you look at the dates, and you look at what's going on. I think it just slipped through the cracks. And sometimes things do slip through the cracks. I mean, it, it's we have rapid construction going on. You're trying rapid. to do your job of inspecting. They're trying to get the homeowners in. I think, honestly, I don't think this problem is going to happen again. But I really believe. I think you've come I up don't with think a there's a site plan that, that came through here and had a 40-foot driveway in the first place. Sometimes, you know that it sometimes was, these it, problems. It was 24, but it turned into 40. Yeah. And it was not on that site yeah. plan at 40 foot. There's no way. It's not you. I think that sometimes these problems arise where the governing bodies have to come over and come in and reevaluate. And it's, I think you're doing a great job. I don't think it falls on you. But again, the drainage, I, 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 it, we do have drainage issues in this county and these rules were set up. I mean, maybe Moyot Crossing doesn't have a drainage problem. And thank God, they're one of the few. We, we get this countywide, so. I have a question, and this is more of your technical preview. Why is it that you cannot, let's let's say, let's go to the driveway situation, the uh, ease, rather the uh, the side easement clear Set side, setback. Why can't a permeable solution go in in that setback? What? If it, you know, a fence could be there. I mean, if something that could be taken out, well, I mean, something that's not truly permanent can be taken out. I, it, it, there's so there's several variables, but the one thing that comes to my mind is the slope and the velocity of that runoff on that on that surface. So I, I like a situation where you have a Lowe's at Nags Head. That's a big parking lot, and it's holding water, and it's not flowing. It's pretty level. Those permeable pavers work there. But let's say you put a driveway on a on the side of a house, and a lot of people, a lot of these are, are sloped. They're turtle-backed lots, and it's got just a slight slope to it. It's not going to infiltrate. It's going to sheet flow off. So maybe if you put a curb along it and held it in and forced it to so but the sheet flow is the issue and it all, doesn't always work maybe you could invert the driveway to slope it toward the house that the driveway serves and let it go that way let them put in some pervious pavers and see if they like that Run off on your neighbor. It's why we developed half of these ordinances about drainage. And it started at the beach with Phil. And you have a low lot, house has been there for 50 years or 20 years, and that neighbor comes in beside you and fills that lot up, puts a driveway right on the line, it's going right on that neighbor. So to make an ordinance countywide like this will have implications. Any suggestions for a remedy for the 
set back the driveways going around the side of the house particularly the ones we have pictures of here I uh, I actually have a bigger issue with the setback than I do the width I, I f it's my opinion that that setback is there to allow that pervious surface that infiltration to have that relief area what if uh, what if you pass this ordinance and it's a it's an existing house that's been there and they want to fill or they want to put their driveway within that 10 foot and we say you're going to run off from your neighbor and then they say well we'll do a stormwater plan and the lot line swell doesn't work anymore because in a subdivision that's designed, that lot line swell is shared by the neighbors, by the property owners. But that lot line swell would have to go on that one property that's doing the encroachment. So you're limiting that ability to prevent that runoff. It could work in places. But to I make think it universal. we were more looking for a solution for these couple homeowners versus passing the ordinance. See, I, I wasn't even aware. I haven't. We haven't been aware, made aware, or I haven't, of how many setback issues we're looking at. I didn't know. <clears> and I think that Moyot crossing too. We've we've as we grow, these are new problems that have came up, and I think staff has come up with some good solutions to alleviate this from happening again in the future that's why we're just kind of looking for a solution for these few homeowners here would have to look i mean how much how much are we talking about i don't know yeah did, did i hear one guy say he was right up to three foot within the property line i mean Well, that's what we're trying to find out of 16 inches with a 12 foot okay, drive that's, where, that's where again I, I i'm not you know at this point i don't think that is that impacting the ability to drive into a three-car drive garage is this house within the 10-foot setback the garage door well i think these are the questions that have to be worked out on the case-by-case -case basis yes so now staff has got to stop and we'll review all these and that's what you're doing. You have a very good point. You're looking at the staff. I don't think we have much of a alternative. Unfortunately. But I am in favor. I understand. I do. And I will do everything I can to work with these property owners and whatever y'all do, I will do my best. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Weatherly? What if, what if the, uh, just for example, the, with, with the current setback at 10 feet, what if the general rule is 10 foot setback, yet it, you could go within five feet if you had engineers certifying that it would not adversely impact the adjoining property owner would would still maintain didn't somebody on the planning board already answer that question i don't i don't know you give them the five foot and then they're going to well I, I, to I mean that I, I, and that's the hard i mean that that's still the hard and fast but they'd have to do that to to accommodate it's been 10 foot for but then years. okay i'm just asking i'm just i'm just so why don't we just say make it five foot and we'll allow them to go up to no three foot. I, i'm not saying no I, I mean i'm saying if you if you were to go 10 feet and allow it under certain strict conditions and the burden was placed on the property owner to come up with an appropriate certification like they have to do for example with a building permit if someone does something out of standard construction, they've got to get uh, uh, certain spans for, for example, for pilings. 
uh, if, if they exceed a certain span, then they've got to get an engineer to certify whatever um, appropriate uh, joists and things need to be in place to, to, to meet that. Well, let me think of a few examples. So let's say you're at the beach and you got sandy soil. Well, maybe that five foot works with the uh, infiltration. Maybe you're in Moyoc and it's just plain old clay and every bit of it sits on top. So there's different situations. You, so let's make and, them and that's hire why a soil scientist while we're at it. Let's make them hire a civil engineer and do a hydraulic analysis on it. And let's go through the storage. And by the time they're done, they spent two or three thousand dollars. Yeah, every situation would be different. Sure. That's why you just have the one standard. Is Ten you foot. If you're hiring the engineer, also, most likely the the engineer is going to whoever's paying them. That, that's who they're going to satisfy. I, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. That was no disrespect to anybody. I'm sorry. I apologize for saying that. But yeah. Anybody else have anything? Nope. Thank you. Right. All right. Can I ask for some clarification? Uh, can you come back up to the podium and again? Sure. And you're Mr. Brook. All right. Uh, I understand that the we've got the 10 foot um, easement going through there, which makes it a 20 foot total easement going between the two houses. Now, the reason for that is for drainage. Is that my understanding? So how is it determined that 10 foot total is not enough as opposed to making it 10 foot wider? Well, if we made it to a five foot, going three, you've got a 10 foot total easement between the two homes for drainage. Now, in what you were saying on a case by case basis, <clears throat> I have not experienced any type of flooding or water standing between our houses with my present driveway the way it sits. Now, I understand what you're saying, that you take it in consideration of all homes in Currituck County. But looking at uh, drainage problems or issues, uh, I don't experience any at all. Now, I, we've had some terrible rainstorms coming through here, and our drainage in our neighborhood is totally adequate. And that's why we were discussing on a through our discussions, I don't know what we'll actually do, but on a case-by-case -case basis, we would have an engineer evaluate yeah, you and your neighbor. Point. and he wants the homeowner to hire a civil engineer to come out and do that study. We're talking big bucks. That is right, and that would be the... Uh, to fall on anybody's shoulders to have to do something like that. I, then the alternative would be to stay off your house 10 foot off the property line 10 foot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If now, you wanted to spend the extra money to go through all that process with a soil engineer and all that, you could, in, this was what we were discussing. Okay, and I thought my point of why I was trying to avoid that, uh, looking at the resale value of my home, curb appeal, the way that I have to do to make the changes. But I understand also that uh, Hardscape cannot exceed 30% of your total lot size. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Well, I'm well within all that. Sure. Setbacks. They're uh, discussing setbacks. Discuss setbacks. Small setbacks. portion of setbacks. Mm, right. That and this, that's, that's what our concerns are about. consideration on my situation. Well, that's what we're trying to do because uh, taking it on a case-by-case -case basis, and again, that's just what we were discussing. Mm -hmm. But your case may be okay. Your house may not flood. Uh, five houses down may not be the case, or the subdivision across the road may not be the case, uh, or one on a different part of the county totally, or a subdivision in a different part of the county may not be the same. Okay. Well, one of the things I'm concerned about, if you um, do not approve this text amendment, do the fines start kicking in until you get it corrected? 
I think it's got to go to the commissioners. What we do is send a recommendation to the commissioners. If the commissioners do not pass it, I'm assuming the fines would be. Uh, but we will get notification well in advance of that. Uh, you'll get notification. Yes, he will get notification, and they will be given uh, time to, depending on the outcome with the uh, the board of commissioners, um, either they're going to be fine because it will be changed, um, or the board of commissioners will give us direction as to how long to give them, or if, if that's not doesn't happen, then we staff would give them uh, an appropriate time to to come into compliance. Yep. We're trying to come up with something that we can recommend to the commissioners that would alleviate the you paying a fine at all. But well, I appreciate it. we don't know that that's possible, but that's what we're aiming for. Well, I understand your situation. Sure. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think we're good, Mr. Weatherly. Is there? Sure. Sure. Um, one is that, just to help you understand the way these property line swales work, typically we will design those things to start at about a foot deep and to be graded from the front. Well, if it's a curb and gutter uh, subdivision, generally those would be graded from front to back, start at about a foot deep, and then they might be a couple of feet deep when you get to the back. If it's a real deep lot, it might be deeper, say three feet in there. In the back. And those have three to one side slopes. So at the beginning of that swale, a foot deep with three to one side slope is going to be six feet wide. Um, and if it's a foot and a half deep as it's going by the house, it's going to be about nine feet wide. So depending on where these driveways are, um, along the, with respect to these uh, to the depth of these swales. Um, a five-foot encroachment may not even be in the swale. That's one of the reasons to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. That swale, if it's if it's a foot and a half deep going by the house, that swale is going to be nine feet wide, and the five-foot encroachment is not going to impact the swale. Uh, another point is that on these newer subdivisions, we typically grade the lots in mass all together and then cut the swale in. Uh, there are situations where you have a lot that's two feet or three feet higher than the adjacent line in some older subdivisions, and Mr. Weatherly makes a good point that you wouldn't really be able to do that without impacting your neighbor. But on these newer subdivisions where they're all graded in mass and then a, a shallow swale cut in, a lot of times you can. They're all the same height. That's interesting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item tonight? All right. Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing. Are there any questions or discussion amongst the uh, board members at this time? Uh What did you find out about us? Um, and I was sorry, I'm contacting it here, the county attorney. Or should we? Um, okay. Because you, you will you have, unless um, there's a continuance or deferral, then you must act upon it within two months. Um, so I was, I was trying to contact the county attorney. I was like, well, it was tabled one time to get more information from DOT, and sorry, I'm just reading just from blank, um, um, and then I asked for it to be removed from the agenda because we had not heard, we had not gotten the information you all requested, um, and he said that, that he's inclined to say um, that the, uh, the planning board may table or continue, but we'll have to make a recommendation within two months of this, of the continuance. Of today. Of today. Um, that is his inclination, so it's not. That's you know. Could could we could we table it tonight and ask for what we discussed earlier is 
staff and DOT work out a solution for these eight homeowners. Do you really think that would be <clears throat> rectified in two months? I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. I'm sorry. Case by case basis for yeah. all um, of them in two months. We will reach out to to NCDOT to their staff um, tomorrow morning and see if 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 we can if we can come to some resolution. If they can give us a that they can. But I, I, I can't speak for DOT of what their workload is and their time frame is to be able to do this. Um, I'm definitely, we're open to this, to working with them to for those deviations. Have a preference at staying it at this level or, I mean, I know if we. If you all want to table it and give us a chance to reach out to DOT and see if they can and give you an update at February meeting at that point I mean that would I'm sorry you know I, I just can't speak to DOT because this so much is hinging on, on is their try. on their input uh, so. I would say at two meetings if we still don't have a solution we send it up to the commissioners and well I mean they try to come up with a solution you know, again let's let's just say they get through two, two of the driveways and we're leaving the door open to we can't approve even three weeks, three months, four months. We can't approve three quarter foot driveways right. because DOT won't take the road over. Right. I mean, it's pretty much set in this way. Right, pretty much. So, I mean, we, we could. S would you rather wait now or would you rather send it to the commissioners? And with a recommendation that this process be what we are recommending. I mean, what do you think? I mean, uh, and, and that's what I'm. I'm and you have two separate issues here too. Mm -hmm. yeah, true. There are two we're separate looking, issues. We're looking at two different like animals. The easement. I'm sorry. It's got to stay the same. Ten foot. We really do need to separate them out. So. Like you said, I mean, it's different in, in the county them. everywhere. Um, do you want to at least vote on the easement right now, and then we continue? Well, I mean, and the board of commissioners can give staff direction to you know to reach out to DOT for that. Um, I'm I will of course reach out this week um, for this, but um, you know since you're kind of on the timetable, um, and, and the board of commissioners has a little bit more uh, flexibility um, to to give us direction um, and to stay any fines or any enforcement action until you know we are we've go, we've gone we've exhausted the route with DOT so until a solutions came up with until a solutions come up with yeah I originally was going to motion not to take an action um, and request that uh, but, I mean, when you read this letter from DOT, I'm not sure we should move to um, keep the driveways as they stand and um, motion to motion to, uh, you know, um, have an ex you know case by case basis here with the with DOT. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm, we can, we could, this won't, I, I don't know. Okay. Gary, it really any does look like DOT is willing to work. It, when you read the letter with DOT, it really looks like they're willing to work to rectify this problem. And in fact, they're willing to allow more providing their contact it and it's worked out between the county and so there's really not a shut the door you'll never get a 40 foot driveway it is do it prior to approval of your permit that that's my interpretation of the email as well um i just can't guarantee a timetable no, of of no. <laughs> 
of input and feedback from DOT on the issue? I would say that we would not pass the tax amendment, that we would send a recommendation to the commissioners to stay all fines, stay the uh, situation enforcement, enforcement action until a the situation is rectified between staff and DOT for these eight homeowners and a suggestion that they look at accepting a five foot setback with a letter from an engineer stating that it's not going to affect his neighbor across the street or next door uh, engineered report Their soil and uh, runoff. I think you, I think you need to keep that a separate issue. Setbacks. Well, it's just a recommendation. Yeah. Okay. We're denying the tax amendment. Yeah. If that would be what we would choose to do. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that that would basically keep everything the same. Yeah. At this level. Until we get some more information. It puts everything on a case by case basis to be resolved for the people that have issues now, but nothing new moving forward that doesn't have a 10-foot setback or a 24-foot driveway. Right. Yeah. That's what it would be. Do I need to restate all that? Um, <laughs> uh, you, you would need to put okay. that in, in the form of a motion. All um, right. I'll make a motion. I'll open the floor for a motion, and then I'll make a motion that we are denying the tax amendment we are advising to the commissioners that we would like to see all fines stayed and uh, all enforcement stayed on these eight homeowners that have the driveway width issue uh, for the case by case to be a uh, resolution came up with on a case by case basis, as so Mr. Ott has stated yeah, in his DOT email. review of each of the existing over with drivers. <clears throat> and that they can, and that the, the commissioners consider accepting a letter from an engineer for the other people, such as Mr. Blaine and Mr. Brooke that have issues with the driveway going around the side of their house to remedy that situation for them. That they would have to get a letter from an engineer stating that they're not going to flood their neighbor or across the street. Is that what you were thinking? Something along those lines. Mm -hmm. That if some certification. What they have now is stays, it's not going to blood anybody. That's my motion. My motion's approved. Are you seconding that? I second that. <laughs> All right. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Is that anyone? I'm with the eyes on this. We'll All right. Some more. Uh, here. Uh. All right. So. Waste time. Motion passes. And our next item is still old business. PB 1925, a request to amend the Unified Development Ordinance Chapter 1, General Provisions Chapter 2, Administration Chapter 3, Zoning Districts Chapter 4, Use Standards Chapter 5, Development Standards Chapter 6, Subdivision Infrastructure Standards, and Chapter 10. Definitions and measurements for the purpose of implementing the Moyoc Megasite Master Plan, Curry Tuck Station, and establishing the Plan Development Curry Tuck Station District and regulations. All right. Uh, 
Take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So at the December planning board meeting, we presented this proposed text amendment and pattern book to the board uh, and reviewed the individual standards that were proposed. Um, it's a lot of information. Hopefully you were able to take this last month to review the documents and um, we can have some good feedback as we go through this. I won't spend a great deal of time on the actual language unless you would rather I do that. But I do want to just reiterate a little bit of information uh, for those that may not have been here last time. Uh, this amendment to the ordinance actually is an implementation of a planning process that began back in 2012 uh, through the Moyoc Small Area Plan that was adopted in 2014. As a result of that um, Moyoc Small Area Plan, it identified an area for employment. And so the county hired a consultant to do a feasibility study, basically a market feasibility study of what type of business opportunities would be allowed or, or could be, um, could accept in a particular area of Moyoc. Well, that began in 2014 and finished up and adopted by the Board of Commissioners in 2016. What that feasibility study identified was about 3,000 acres for about 3,000 dwelling units, some commercial and some industrial areas. Uh, what, that, what that then uh, recommended was a master plan to be developed. So that began shortly after the adoption of the feasibility study. We began the process for creating the master plan and that ended up getting approved by the Board of Commissioners in 2017 that outlined an area um, a little over 3,000 acres for the Moyoc mega site that was then re later relabeled Curry Tuck Station. And Curry Tuck Station uh, is now at the point where we're doing the text amendment to implement all of those plans. Um, about a two-year process. Nothing's ever quick, is it? <laughs> so the text amendment that you have before you established several sub-districts. Um, and a zoning district for the particular area that extends from the Virginia State Line west of Caratoke Highway all the way down to South Mills Road and out to areas that um, are near Northwest Backwoods Road. Uh, this text amendment includes language that would um, provide for a transportation corridor overlay that would be over Caratoke Highway and South Mills Road. It would require action as part of um, the request to uh, establish this district. Uh, you would also be doing a rezoning that would eliminate particular uses over uh, those roads. The Board of Commissioners could elect at any time to implement that through the standard rezoning process should they do so. It is separate and not a part of Curry Tuck Station. Um, so it, it could involve properties outside of that boundary. However, it would have to go through the standard rezoning process for that to occur. It provides the development and community, community form standards for Curry Tech Station. And what it also does is it looks at other sections of the ordinance that uh, needed updating as well, the use table, design standards, parking, loading, and exterior lighting. So with this text amendment, it establishes the district and, and several sub-districts and their intended use, density, and height limitation, and it varies. The intensity of the uses are in the center core area, which is center station. Uh, that's a mixed-use development with um, dwelling units in the range of five to eight dwelling units per acre up to 12, um, two to four stories with the ability to go up to five with mixed use. Um, and then carry, they're pretty much in order in terms of intensity. Charter is a, is a mixed-use district uh, that is surrounding uh, Center Station, and Crossroads is the industrial area. Cypress is the residential component of this uh, area. Junction, that's a developed area that we are incorporating and allowing those property owners that should they choose to do so, uh, they could rezone their property, redevelop under these standards as well. 
Um, the, it's the northern portion of this boundary, and it made sense since it was the gateway. It starts at the state line. Like North Point? It's North Point, and the property is along Caratoke Highway <coughs> down to Countryside Estates. Um, Moyock Run uh, is, is the area that's identified for the civic uses, the school, and any other type of governmental type uses. Uh, Newtown is the developed area, very similar to Junction, and has very similar uses and requirements. And Oak Trail is the area that has some low density residential and also some environmental, most likely some environmental issues as well. We don't know, those properties haven't been flagged by the Corps. Um, properly drained, it could change the characteristics. So it could allow for some residential density as well. The TCOD, as I mentioned, um, that requires action by the board. It lists some uses that would not be allowed once it's established and provides for some access control along those streets. So when looking at the various sections that are really unrelated to Curry Tuck Station that we're also amending, uh, what, it, what we're looking at doing is making some changes to the parking requirements where it establishes an alternative um, plan or an allowance for on-street parking. A bicycle uh, parking, we're modifying the regulations to go <coughs> from, to allow for more flexibility and to go away from a standard that we currently have and provide uh, someone flexibility to put them and we don't have a lot of opportunities for bicycle parking, but uh, since we don't, uh, we're, we're going to drop that down just a little bit and give them the flexibility to put it in where needed. Parking, landscaping, exterior lighting plan standards, all of those are establishing the plan requirements, what actually needs to be on the plan. Right now, uh, what we receive, they're not all consistent with information. So um, this actually helps guide the development community and gives them the, the base information that they need to provide to the county on their plans. Exterior lighting, it establishes a maximum um, height limit for residential lighting. The street lighting is what you typically see with residential lighting and it establishes that at 15 feet. That's very typical for residential subdivisions and establishes pedestrian lighting standards. It also restricts the access on South Mills Road. It adds South Mills Road to that list of restricted access streets uh, where we limit the number of driveways uh, a particular property can have. It establishes crosswalk and street section width standards, uh, multi-family design standards, there's some modifications in there, um, requires an elevated foundation. You may remember we talked about that last at last meeting. Um, requires that at least, it may not always be on a crawl space foundation, it could still be on a slab, but it would give the appearance that, that the foundation's off the ground, steps down. Um, Non-residential design standards, there are some modifications to that as well. Um, and then of course, the, the Curry Tech Station community form standards are part of this amendment. The pattern book was developed by a consultant and really gives architectural guidance. And I want to use the term guidance uh, very, very loudly because it is not a regulatory document. Um, it is used to help guide and, and establish a pattern for um, Curry Tuck Station. And uh, what it, it actually shows is the most of the building patterns will have pitch roofs, steep porches, roof dormers, shedded entries, uh, excuse me, sheltered entries, chimneys or elevate and eleva elevated foundations, public spaces, it looks at the stormwater parks, amenities, streets, and other pedestrian elements as well. Um, we have found several um, errors in there, and we'll talk about some modifications that we want to make um, to that pattern book. Since it is still in the draft form, it pretty much shows uh, the building patterns to be set for the entire Curry Tuck Station, and those are for commercial and um, mixed use and multifamily. And they use some of the existing historical buildings 
in the community that they found to pull from those architectural features. Um, doesn't mean that every building in that development will look like that, and that we really want to emphasize that. But those are options in which you can use if you're doing a development, um, commercial development in that, in that plan development. Street patterns, we did not establish minimum street widths in the ordinance and make it regulatory, but this gives patterns in which uh, one could use to set particular areas uh, where to incorporate features, pedestrian features, bike paths, bike lanes, landscaping, street lights, building placement, that type of thing. The public space patterns, it identifies several options and opportunities for um, incorporating stormwater improvements as well as establishing green space, open space, plazas uh, throughout, throughout the uh, sub-districts. We've had the opportunity over the past couple of months to sit down with several of the stakeholders and the stakeholders includes property owners, um, business community, as well as many developers. And we had them look at the ordinance and we had them look at the pattern book to make sure that we were not heading in a direction that would cause extreme cost to a particular uh, development in this. And if so, what ways could we improve um, the language or the patterns? And one thing that was pointed out to us is that vertical mixed use is very hard to sell. And so we want to make sure that if we were requiring it, that we also um, allow for the opportunity where you could do horizontal mixed use. Because they say a lot of times, unless you're in a large city, people don't like to live over top of commercial businesses. I have a problem living near them, but don't like to live directly over top of them. Um, so one thing that we do, <coughs> We do allow for the mixed use to be horizontal and vertical, so we're okay with that one. Um, they also ask that we consider a percentage of rot-resistant materials, and that aids in the ability for maintenance so that you don't have long-term maintenance problems there, and it also builds into um, the appearance of the development. The more wood and more, um, the more materials that are used that could tend to rot can can cause maintenance problems. Um, all of these are components that can be allowed. Uh, there's we, establishing a percentage that's entirely up to this planning board if they want to make a recommendation in doing that. We would prefer that that actually be something that the developer chooses to do. Uh, if we see that that's starting to be a problem, then um, we can look to address that. I would think that they would they would keep maintenance up in these areas. Consider single hung windows, and that's in the pattern book. All of them indicate double hung windows are the preferred um, type window style, and we are going to recommend some modifications to some of those pages in the pattern book that are specific to certain uh, types of, of windows. And again, the pattern book is a guide. It is not a requirement. There's nothing written in the code that requires double hung windows. Um, consider requiring elevators for multifamily and state that those um, elevators would serve no more than 75 units. And what we were told, if you do that, that builds value. And not everyone's going to do a development that is going to put in um, that type of equipment. So you're saying Every, As this is every just 75 comments, units, you need a new you elevator. You need an elevator. I got you. Uh, that is not something that we want to regulate in a code. Uh, as it, We would let the building code manage that. And, um, but it's a unless the board so chose to do so, <laughs> uh, not something <clears throat> that we would want to put directly in the ordinance. Consider establishing a 10 foot minimum first floor height and not first floor height and nine feet for all other floors. That's entirely up to the board if they want to do that. I think um, that becomes more of a design element that that, as you're designing your project, that's something that 
we would leave that alone and let you decide it. Um, consider requiring a percentage percentage of fenestration on um, all building facades. We have it as it faces streets, and it was suggested that you do it on all of them. Um, it's up to the planning board uh, at this point. I don't know that there's a true need. We can look at each project as it comes in. Uh, there's going to be a rezoning. There's going to be modifications to the pattern book. There's going to be modifications to the master plan. There will be a whole new set of um, uh, terms and conditions for each one of these developments, and I feel like we can manage that independently as these projects come in and not so much in a regulatory manner. Because you still want to have the flexibility to do the projects in these areas. Uh, they ask that we review a property line conflict with Newtown and Center Station and their uses, and that's at the intersection. Uh, there's there's some property line overlaps and um, one of the recommendations was consider changing a portion of the new town to charter that is something that we would like to incorporate <coughs> um, because it does or allow for we'll talk about various options that we can um, address that concern large multifamily buildings appear to be very expensive and what that stems from are the um, balconies, the mini balconies and the, the mini openings where you have the potential for water to infiltrate into the, to the units. Um, again, that is guidebook, not a regulatory document, so all of those elements are not something that they have to do. Consider the use of stone or stone base in the dog parks. Dog parks, um, grass often dies. Grass and artificial turf are recommended options. Again, not a requirement. They could certainly use um, other, other elements if they wanted to do so. I tell you, when they started reviewing these, they really got deep down into it. And, and um, they were passionate about some of them. <laughs> uh, and this was one of them. Consider traditional architecture, less coastal influence. Um, the term beachy, they did not like the beachy look. So there is a recommendation that we will offer up for that. So far as the staff comments are concerned, uh, we do believe that there should be a better transition between the center station and the new town sub-district on the south side so it does not split the property lines. Uh, we can manage that in three different options. We could shift the sub-district line now um, to include land that's now Newtown up to the Lazy Corner Road. That's a good break point. Um, the reason for that is Newtown is more low density, low intensity commercial uses. Char Charter has the ability to do a little bit of both. You can, it's, like, it's like that good transition between Center Station and to the existing residential development. Um, at that intersection, you probably will need a little more intense uses. And we can either look at modifying the use table in that instance to allow for some uh, more intense commercial uses in the Newtown subdistrict. That Newtown subdistrict runs all the way down to South Mills Road. So that's an option. Uh, I would recommend that we look at professional services, medical type uses that could be <coughs> allowed in there and look at uh, maybe even some more uh, commercial retail type uses that would be allowed in that Newtown district. Or you can choose to um, not make a change at this time and allow the update or the amendment to occur at rezoning. We know there's a conflict there. I would recommend that we do either option one or option two. Either one are good solutions. Uh, one would require a modification to the map. Two would just require a modification to the table, but would increase uses um, in, in the uh, new town. Um, the modification to the map clears up that split between the property lines. So it, it, either either of those three options work. 
but we can talk about that more as I finish up these. Okay. Um, pattern book corrections. There's some. There's some typos. Some um, incorrect references and uh, some images that need to be updated for some of the sub districts. I'll be meeting with uh, the consultant tomorrow to go over um, those suggest suggested changes, whatever we uh, elect to do tonight, and. Um, so that we have a good, clean copy for the Board of Commissioners. We're also going to suggest that we remove some of the material requirements for each of the sub-districts. And those are the single-page color copy images. Because there's, I mean, there's, what, six, eight of the same unit that appear throughout the whole document, you really don't need to go into detail of what every single unit needs to have for the cladding needs to have for um, the shutter type or the decking material. Um, <coughs> but to keep the image in there, I think that's perfectly fine. But the display of what type of material needs to be used can be selected on another page. And um, it has the appearance that that's all you can use in that particular sub-district and we don't want to give that appearance. We'd rather it be, uh, this is this type of building. This is what it, this style would be used for, and you can pick from these materials. Um, and even provide for some more traditional architecture or building form elevations for center station and charter sub-districts. And what we mean by that would be what you typically see today with some of those buildings. Very simple. Um, and I think that was the point with the, with the pattern book was to make things very simple. Um, nothing elaborate, nothing. But, but give the appearance that yes, you can do these types of, of options in that sub-district and here's, here's a design that. So that's the stakeholder comments that we've received up till now. Um, I don't anticipate we will receive any more. Uh, staff comments, that's a pretty thorough uh, list as well. Um, I just asked the board to consider those three options. Um, any one of those will will work, and if you want can, to talk those show through, it? we can. I, I think if you could just show us on a map what lines you're talking about. So, okay. Here's Curry Tuck Station, our center station. Excuse me. This is the boundary, or it's about where the Winslow Road is. Mm-hmm. In this area, it splits some of the property lines. So if you were to come in and rezone your property to Curry Tuck Station, Newtown Subdistrict, or Center Station Subdistrict, you have the ability to do a couple of different things. So we already know there's a conflict between those property lines, plus pushing that Newtown use right up against Center Station probably isn't a good transition. So if you've wrapped the charter district down to Lazy Corner <coughs> Road, which would take in these properties about right here and give you a good boundary, um, we, that would probably be better served. What about on the north side of so Center So the north station? side, you have a center station that goes right to, to the junction um, junction is more of a developed area. Uh, we do have some vacant property down in this area that is possibly slated for development. This is all developed up here. Uh, could you have a similar situation up there? You could. You could. So that gets to, because junction, junction and Newtown are very similar. Mm -hmm. in terms of their uses. I, it, so you, I just, you could, if you, the north side of that center station doesn't meet the, does it follow a property line? 
Oh, that one does follow property lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only place where you have problems following property lines um, is it is because that's all existing development. You have you'll have some issues in here, and those can be addressed when you when they come in with. When they submit a site plan. We anticipate modifications <clears throat> to the master plan and modifications to the sub-district map as projects come in. That will be anticipated. Because they may only take down, I don't know, 100 acres. And well, so one property owner may be willing to sell, one may not. This is not, this is not one individual property owner. It is not... Uh, the county doesn't own uh, anything other than the piece that where the wastewater right. treatment plant is located, and then another piece along um, uh, Newtown Road, which also had a wastewater treatment plant on it. But those are the only pieces that they own um, inside the the core of this. So we, whoever whoever is the willing seller, whoever is the willing developer. Uh, will come in and we anticipate modifications to this. As we work through it. It's a new concept where we actually have a master plan that's been approved um, in advance of a project being submitted. So without, without having someone that's going to develop it, uh, in place, a master developer makes it a little more difficult um, to be able to nail down a full plan. But it does set aside those areas. It's a, you know that the the bypass, the uh, east-west connector. It sets aside and plans for the future development of those areas. Are one of those options you prefer? Option, uh, option two. one. Or you said two. option two, right? One or two um, does work. Mm -hmm. uh, three just kicks the can down the road and puts puts it on whoever submits the application to make the modification. It will have to be modified at some point. Um, two what? two will. Two fixes the use conflicts. It does not fix the, the boundary conflict. Number one fix changes it on the map. Number one changes it on the map. I don't. We, I don't see those three options on. Yeah, I couldn't find them. So, if we need to include that in a motion, we do need to. We. I would recommend that <coughs> uh, you include that in a motion. Okay. And if the, board, just say if the planning one? board sees any of these other stakeholder comments that you'd like to incorporate into a motion, we can look at those as well. We can just say option one. Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll meet with the um, consultant and um, discuss that with them present that to the Board of Commissioners. Ultimately, it will be their decision, um, but we will, mm -hmm. we will present, <coughs> present that to them. Is there anything else we need to include in the motion? Not at this time. Can you go back to the stakeholders' mm -hmm. comments? You said that this is really just an advisory. It's really the pattern book's a guide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not overly concerned about the mm -hmm. the references that are made for for that because it is a guide. I'm, I'm fine. Was there any of the other items you wanted to include in there? Mm -hmm. Because it is a, you know, just a guide. I think putting that in there might confuse people. Mm -hmm. Like glass, and, you know, 
that might be a turn off and just being well the fin when you speak to the fenestration we, that's actually in the ordinance okay uh, and what we're requiring is a minimum percentage along um, facades that face streets which makes sense mm -hmm. um. Is there any of that stuff you think needs to be in there that we would need to include in the, the space? I think most of these can be handled either in a terms and conditions with the project that comes in. Um, it's really hard to tell what's going to come. Putting this detailed regulation in the ordinance. The fenestration is one you could add if you wanted to. I don't know what percentage we'd put on all facades um, some may not it may not matter because it may not face anything but another building <laughs> yeah I just wanted to see it I, I wanted to go over each one again I'd rather look at a project that comes in and be able to discuss that through the terms and conditions with the plan development and with these projects once we do hopefully get a master developer that will look at especially the commercial end of it we sat down with um, the boards and go into detail those terms and conditions so everyone understands the expectations leading into uh, the rezoning. Mm -hmm. Maybe even schedule work sessions with the, with the board. A lot of time needs to be spent on the terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you go back to your recommendation? I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you think option one is better that the maps be changed or? I think eventually the map's going to have to be changed, so you might as well do it now. It will have to be changed at some point. Mm -hmm. The but question is, do you do it now or with the rezoning? Mm -hmm. The thing about the, the lots that are located um, really between Winslow Road and Lazy Corner Road. They're developed lands. They're relatively small. Um, you probably don't want to put a big requirement of amending a whole master plan on them to just change a few acres. And here or there. option three is really always there. Isn't it? It's always there. Right. So if something's not right and you need to change it again, mm -hmm. you can. You can. Yeah. Master so, plan can be modified yeah. as well as the as the uh, sub district map. Yeah. Okay. You prefer option one. I think option one is is the best one for right now. Okay. It addresses the property line issue and it also addresses the use issue. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody, anybody else have anything? No. Nope. <clears throat> anything else? All right. Uh, we can skip some of the representation. Is there anybody here to speak on this item tonight? Megasite, Curry Tech Station. Mr. Weather, you want you anything? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll close the public hearing. Is there any more discussion with the board? Hearing none, I'll open the floor for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion to amend the UDO Chapter 1 General Provisions, Chapter 2 Administration, Chapter 3 Zoning Districts, Chapter 4 Use Standards, Chapter 5 Development Standards, Chapter 6 Subdivision Infrastructure Standards, and Chapter 10 Definitions and Measurements for the purpose of implementing the Moyoc Megasite Master Plan, Curry Tuck Station, and establishing the Plan Development Curry Tuck Station District and Regulations. Subject to staff comment option one which we will we will go ahead and i don't know how we want to word highly recommend that 
we go with option one under the section of staff comments and taking into account staff recommendations um, for the request statement of consistency and reasonableness listed in the staff report. Could you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> That was good. Um, we have a motion. Any any second? A second. All right. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. And we have one more item. New business, PB 1928, Curtis Bay Medical Waste. A text amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance, Chapter 4, Use Standards and Chapter 10, Definitions and Measurement to Allow Warehousing and Distribution of Medical Waste with a Use Permit in the Heavy Industrial HI Zoning District. Uh, staff presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to kind of go through this briefly so we can okay. go home. Uh, I'm, I misrepresented the length of this meeting to the applicant, and I apologize for that. Uh, we, um, we didn't think it was going to be this long either. <clears throat> so the proposed tax amendment uh, is f to allow warehousing and distribution of medical waste in the heavy industrial zoning district uh, after securing a use permit from the Board of Commissioners. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, so Curtis Bay provides medical waste collection services here in the county and the surrounding area. Um, and that process does involve the gathering of medical waste from, I'm assuming, doctors' offices, hospitals, that sort of thing. Um, and then they're brought to a site and stored there inside of trailers. Well, first of all, it's in containers and then inside of trailers until such time that that trailer is full and then they drive it off to a different location. Petersburg, Virginia, where it's then processed and disposed of. Um, so they've actually been operating here for some time in the county. They just have yet to obtain the necessary permits to be doing that um, in accordance with the ordinance. And that's why they're here to try to try to rectify that situation. They're currently operating at the Spruill Mine site at 913 Caratoke Highway. I don't know if you guys are familiar where the Spruill Mine is. Some of you probably are. Um, and so we have sent them notice of violation, um, but have temporarily stayed any fines while they're going through this process to try to fix the situation. Um, more history. Uh, in 2009, the Board of Adjustment did grant a conditional use permit to a company called Stericycle to do a very similar operation here in the county. Uh, they're located also in the heavy industrial zoning district up in Moyoc on Windchaser Way. Um, and that uh, conditional use permit had a requirement, no, it had a few requirements, but uh, one was that a Type C buffer yard be required along the frontages to screen the use from um, off-site views. So you, you'll see that, well, you won't see because I didn't actually put it in the staff report, but I've added it in pen that that be carried over uh, as a requirement. Um, so we'll talk about that again later. Um, <clears throat> they are also proposing uh, that the definition of medical waste be added to Chapter 10 definitions. Um, So the text, the text amendment appears to be uh, consistent with the goals and objectives of the land use plan um, for those policies listed in the staff report. And so I, I would um, like to make a recommendation here and kind of go over our suggested, um, our suggested specific use standards. And we, we're also suggesting that this be added, that there are some standards actually added to the specific use standards section, which wasn't proposed by the applicant, but um, it's going to be easier to, and cleaner to regulate it that way. Um, 
<clears throat> so uh, the first one would be that medical waste shall not be held on site for more than five days. That was actually something that was proposed by the applicant, um, which kind of leads me to believe that it doesn't really hang around too long in one place. Um, when medical waste warehousing and distribution occurs on the same parcel as a state permitted mining operation, the warehousing and distribution activities shall not take place when, within the area permitted for use as a mine. So when you get a mining permit from the state, I guess there's a boundary to that, an area that you're allowed to, to operate in. So we're suggesting that this other operation would have to take place outside of that. Um, there should be no outdoor storage of medical waste and that all waste shall be kept inside approved containers, trailers, or structures. <clears throat> D, that all federal, required federal, state, and local permits are maintained. Uh, e, that a type C buffer yard is required when necessary to screen the use from off-site views. And uh, lastly, the processing or disposal of medical waste shall not occur on site. So there will be no disposal of it on the property that they're, that they're wanting to use. Um, I'd also like to note that neither the current nor the previous unified development ordinance allowed storage of hazardous waste on a mining site. So that would be a change in policy uh, if this gets approved. Um, and that we, we tried to address that conflict there in the staff recommendation B, where we said that it can occur within the boundary of the mining operation. Those last two. Yeah, they're not on there. Okay. Yeah, E and F, I just. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Sorry. So if you make a motion, you might want to just say that. E and F. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I'm just making sure. And also wanted to clarify that even, even if the text amendment gets approved now that uh, that Curtis Bay will still have to secure the use permit in order to operate. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I do not know where the mine, the mine is at. Where, where uh, is it's that? It's off Guinea Road. You know where Guinea Road is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just after it splits, it's up on the right side way back. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. And how long has this been here? Oh, you can. Sure. Two, uh, two years. Yeah. Sure. You were next on the list. <laughs> so, so My come on up. August with Curtis Bay. So I started with Curtis Bay in um, end of July of 2018. And the site was already there. Um, I didn't find out that it wasn't use until uh, Miss Anderson came out. Um, and what was it about May? Uh, so that's where the whole process has started. Uh, so we've had numerous conversations with Lori, Rachel Anderson, now Jason. Uh, Ed was here, um, and uh, so we've been on the property, and it's Mr. School right here um, as well. Um, so. Like Jason said, everything comes in off the trucks. It's already packaged in DOT approved containers. That's our business. We are compliance, so that's what we do. Um, it comes off the truck, goes onto a scale, just gets weighed, scanned so that we can track everything, immediately goes right onto a trailer, and then we run trailers every day. Um, the five day comes in just in case of some weather event that we can't move anything. Um, generally, the longest anything is on that site is from a Friday night to a Monday morning. Um, so everything is uh, usually gone within 24 hours, and then we take it over to Petersburg, Virginia, uh, where we process. So we're up and down the East Coast. Okay. Is it a building or this a, is a yard? Canopy and or? Then there's a yard where we stage the trailers and the trucks, and then there is a small building that houses the scale. So we just back up go down, weigh it, and then it comes back up, lift gate onto a trailer, and it's a, it's a transportation yard. Sure. Okay. All right. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, I do. Okay. Um, just going back to the 
conditional use permit um, that was issued in 2009, there were a couple of questions on there that I'd like him to elaborate on <clears throat> if he could. Well, the first one says, please clarify and provide details for vehicle maintenance, including interior trailer wash down. Do you do any sort of cleaning of the vehicles on site? Um, it's, a light, it's a spray down, but everything stays contained. How does that so work? It's a um, B and G's type sprayer, like a garden type sprayer, <coughs> bleach solution. Mm -hmm. It's light. You go down do that. Is there some sort of a mechanism that catches the runoff from that, or it's a real fine spray? It's like a mist. Uh huh. Oh, you just leave it in the truck. It's not a runoff situation. No. I got Don't you. wash it back out. Mm -hmm. Now we do take the trucks offsite, and they go to a regular truck wash. We go to Rider, is who we lease our trucks from. So we take them to there. For, is it weekly? Um, could you clarify any odors that could possibly be generated from the storage in the trailers? Um, medical waste can have an odor. <coughs> um, once again. Uh, we use deodorizers, deodorizers, um, Odoban. Um, we do keep everything, like I said, with bleach, fogging everything. Um, the waste isn't sitting there very long. So, and that's done every day after the truck gets unloaded. So, then the trailers move out. And where we're set back right now, pretty far away from just about anything. Yeah. That's all the questions I have. Okay. Um, anyone else? Do you have any permanent employees right there off, off Guinea Road, or is it just the truck drivers coming in and out? Truck drivers plus? Uh, manager and a few That kind of... Um, it makes me want to possibly add another standard that you be a certain distance from residents or something like that. You're pretty far away from anybody's house, aren't you? <coughs> Probably a mile. Yeah. So maybe we should consider, because of the potential for odor, to be a certain distance away. I've, I've never felt it. I'm in there every day. Now, I don't know if that would cause a problem with the other existing business, uh, Stereocycle. I'm not sure where, the, where they're located. They're probably, what's it about? A mile and a half, two miles down. From you? Yeah. Do you know anything about their site? It's it's sound, well, it's similar. It's fenced in. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty big site. They do the exact same thing. They, they all go to route trucks every day onto yeah. the trailer. Right. And they they don't even sanitize their, their uh, trailer or their trucks. They don't smell anything. They're they're right there by East Coast Demolition. Well, you you said you've been there. Yeah. Do you ever smell? No. Okay. No, it's it's it's, I mean, it's a clean facility. Down. You've got waste that's inside of a bag, typically, or some other container. So yeah. It's in another container inside of a truck. It's really difficult to get putrefaction to the odors from that to come outward any coming I mean, okay. any, any distance at all. Well, maybe it's unnecessary then. That's all I've got. Okay. Anybody else? What are your plans for the future? Are you expanding? <coughs> yeah, I mean, we've been growing constantly. Um, currently, we operate from Georgia um, up through New Jersey. Uh, for this site for specifically? For this site, um, yeah. we just keep growing. Uh, we keep adding um, new hospitals. Um, the biggest anchor for this area actually handles Norfolk and then all the way down through. Um, you familiar with Santera, uh, Santera Healthcare? So we service that for them. Uh, so that's kind of our big anchor. And then, honestly, anything between a hospital like that um, down to a uh, tattoo parlor, um, anything and with negative waste. You're on what now, an acre, 10 acres? What is it going to be? About, about five acres. Do you see it's using plenty. more than that later? Um, don't know if we'd need any more <coughs> than that. Um, we would maybe have to possibly build something else there. I, okay, that was that was how my many, question. How many trucks coming in out of there a day? Five. Five trucks. Five smaller trucks. And so Twenty-six foot box trucks. Okay. 
Hit anybody else? Any other questions? All right. Well, I think we're good for right now. Thank you. Mm. Where were we? I'll now open the floor for public comment if there's anyone else here that wishes to speak on that. Okay. <clears throat> we'll close the public comment. Are there any more questions or discussions at this time? Hearing none, I'll open the floor for a motion. We have a motion. Approve a text amendment to the UDO Chapter 4 Use Standards and Chapter 10 Definitions and Measurement to allow warehousing and distribution of medical waste with the use permit in the heavy industrial zoning district. Subject to staff's recommendations, including <coughs> adding Section E to our package which would be a type C buffer yard as required along the entire lot frontage, excluding the power line easement. And you had another one. Oh, yeah. uh, well, that was the wording from the old one. Um, what I, <coughs> just to say it again, um, a type C buffer yard is required when necessary to screen the use from off-site views. And F was the processing or disposal of medical waste shall not occur on site. So we need A, B, C, D, and F. A, B, C, D, E, and F. E and F. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, uh, motion passes. Congratulations, gentlemen. With that, uh, I don't think we have anything else unless anybody has any announcements. Any announcements? <laughs> I brought <laughs> something fun. After this meeting, Ed, there's, <laughs> my brain's not working on the fun okay. part right now. <laughs> well, Happy New Year, everybody, and uh, meeting is adjourned.